The deck was covered in a thin coat of green mold. The motor was stripped like it had been pulled to pieces. Nothing shined anywhere on the boat. The surfaces were worn, the paint uneven. On deck, two plucked birds the size of chickens glistened. The pink meat a testament to their freshness. Seabird feathers caked the walls, stuck to the seats and floated in the water that sloshed across the filthy deck. A tangle of blue and white nylon cord was attached to the shards of a sea anchor. Bird bones scattered the deck like twigs. A dead turtle, partly eaten, lay next to an empty turtle shell and the entire boat was engulfed in the stench of death. Staring in awe, the group of men slowly took in what they saw in front of them. When a man had arrived claiming to be lost at sea, they in fact believed him to be lost. But for how long and how did he survive? Who was this man and where did he come from? Welcome to Tragedy with a View. I'm Kayla and Amanda's with me again. Yay. Yay. And almost unbelievable. Unbelievable. Like the first time I read it, I was like, this is, this is not real. This is not a true story. And then I actually like did a little bit of research on it and I was just like, oh, this actually is a true story. And then I read it again and I had the same like, this, like it boggles my mind. How? That's so long. This happened. And we're gonna talk about it. Real quick housekeeping note. Apparently leaving reviews or rating podcasts really helps the algorithm with something. I don't really know exactly how it works because I'm not the technology person. But if you are enjoying these episodes, please write us a review or share it with your friends, leave a rating. I don't know what apps have what all options, but if you could do that, I would appreciate it. It's a really simple, free way for you to support a very small podcast that continues to grow. And I appreciate all of the uh, repeat listeners. I can see the pattern of people coming back to listen okay, again really? and again. It's, oh, good. it's cool to see that like I do have people who like they listen the day that an episode is released. Oh, and nice. I'm like, that's that's such a that's such a good feeling. I wish I could do more episodes because like it just kind of like you know, it's like the kind like builds momentum. It's a it's like yeah. a little bit of a reward. Like <laughs> I I put a lot of work into this and now I'm seeing like, oh people actually enjoy this. So moving on to a very small town in Mexico called Costa Azul. Salvador Alvarenga, who we're gonna I'm just going to call him Alvarenga throughout this because Salvador just feels so much harder to say than Alvarenga. I don't think either of them do, yeah. but it just, that's what makes sense in my head. Alvador, Alvador. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. Oh my gosh, please leave that in. <laughs> Literally okay. right after you said it, you s a mashup. Actually, she lied. From now on, it's going to be Alvador. <laughs> Okay, Alvarenga <laughs> sat on the beach looking out at the ocean, surveying the waves, the weather, and he was prepping for his next fishing voyage. It was November 17th, 2012, and he, along with several others, were looking towards the sky, knowing a storm was coming, but hoping to get another run in before it got bad. Costa Azul is a tiny town in Chiapas, which is near the Gulf of Tupantepec. The Gulf meets with the Pacific Ocean, and Costa Azul is just north of Central America and is so small that many immigrants completely skip over it, but it offers beautiful white sand beaches and a variety of species of fish, hummingbirds, other birds, and mammals. In 2008, Alvarenga was living and working as a baker in El Salvador. But after falling into a fight with a rough group and he found out that the opposing group actually wanted him dead and they were like hunting him, he decided that he needed to leave. Like a fishing gang? Um, I don't think so. So what, if I remember correctly, he had been at a bar and got into a fight with a guy and this guy and his friends essentially beat him up. And so the, the, the part that I actually wrote down was that he was thrown out the door onto the street 
before being stabbed and then left on the road to die. In the end, he had 11 stab wounds, three broken ribs, and a concussion. Jeez. And so when he was released from the hospital two or three weeks later, he decided that for the safety of like himself and his family, he needed to leave. So he had been living with his parents and his daughter, Fatima, who I don't remember how old she was when he left, but she was very young. So he left and found himself in Costa Azul and very quickly took to the fishing atmosphere that was there. He was 30 years old. He was a natural on the water and willing to go on multi-day ocean excursions to bring home multiple coolers full of fish and shark. So they would, they have coolers on their boats. They would go out, they would basically stay out until their cooler was full and then they would bring it back in, unload and immediately leave again. Was he like freelance or was he working with he started out as like a, there's, there's like fishing companies there that the vibe that I got was like, once you were on like their roster, you worked for them, but you pretty much had free reign to do whatever you wanted to do. So he, it turns out he had a decade of experience on the water, which helped him really feel at home there. And unfortunately, fishing and this type of work did not pay super, super well. It paid enough that he was like able to get food and he had uh, like shack to live out of, but he spent most of the time that he was inland partying anyways. So he didn't really care like where he was living or where he was staying. So the area that the men launch their boats from was kind of surrounded by land. There was like a little channel. So there's like Costa Azul, there's a little land channel and they go through this channel and then there's like a small little area that meets the ocean. And this channel is called the Costa Azul Lagoon, which cuts sharply to the right where dangerous waves pummel like a wall on a small opening that they had to go through to access the ocean. But this geography allowed Costa Azul to have a buffer from severe weather, which often was brought in this way because storms that swirl southwest would dull in this area as it was like meeting land. And they would often also get, get storms off of the Sierra Madre Mountains which would amplify the winds and cause them to double or triple in speed. And then because of this location, those storms would then again, kind of like hunker down over that gulf. And they would frequently last five to seven days. And if you were on the water, they were deadly. Every time they went out to fish, were they always going through the lagoon gauntlet to the open ocean? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So every day they were taking that, that journey? Yes. Through, okay. From what I'm understanding, most of the time it was like calm enough that, you know, the people who had experience were just like, you go, you go through it, like yeah. it's fine, no problem. But then as storms moved in, from my understanding, like if they were expecting one of these storms that like really just like stayed and hunkered down, they, they wouldn't go out, they wouldn't risk it. Well, that actually might not be true based on the information we're gonna learn here. That might not be true. That's what I would do. <laughs> There's a storm coming? Okay, I'm gonna stay right here. <laughs> oh, it's raining in 64? No thanks. No, nah, I'll pass. <laughs> um, so the storms that came into this area and were the deadly ones are called Nortinos. And if one of these storms hit, fishermen were told to stay in port or turn south and travel for 200 to 300 miles before the wind began to break, all while praying their boat wouldn't sink. In addition to this, so apparently sharks follow storm tracks because it causes fish to do, they do predictable things, and so it's easier for them to get meals. Mm -hmm. So they follow these, I don't, I don't understand how they're following the storms, if they're like ahead of them or behind them or like what it is, but the sharks also then learned that these boats often had a lot of fish around them. So they would 
congregate around the boats that they found. And if anything dropped into the water, the sharks would just devour it, Dang. which is kind of a scary, That's terrifying. scary thought. Yeah. When Alvaranga arrived, the locals were slow to appreciate his presence, but they were quickly won over with his enthusiasm to help establish fishing companies. And he would sweep up and clean up the touristy part of town, like completely free. He wasn't working for anyone. He was just trying to keep things nice. And this got him a lot of friends and a lot of connections. And he ended up finding work as a fisherman's assistant. And he would bring in the fishing lines during trips. And he regularly insisted that they needed to be brought in perfectly. And if they weren't stored just right, he would pull them all out and re-roll them and put them back away. So he was like meticulous with his, his work. Fishing was a hard job and extremely rare to actually get in on a fishing crew in this area because inflation and overfishing both had a huge impact on the job. The lagoon and golf were nearly wiped out of fish. And because of the high prices of fish, they wanted to continue to bring in the fish. So the men just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper into the ocean to follow essentially where the fish are. Sometimes they would go as far as 100 miles off of the coast. Tuna, mahi-mahi, marlin, and shark were highly sought after. And despite huge efforts to conserve the species, they are still hauling in these fish every time they string, they string out their lines, which <laughs> I have thoughts about conservation, which do not pertain to the story. Ooh, wait, thoughts about conservation. I, well, I mean, I don't think we're doing enough. Oh, okay. To, to protect certain animals. And I don't think it's because there isn't the want or the need or the drive to do it. I just think there's, there's not enough manpower. Yeah. And it's a really unfortunate battle that you end up being in. And I feel very strongly about protecting the animals, like any animal that's endangered or is, is threatened even, just leave them alone. Let them thrive for a little while longer and then you can go back to it. But like, yeah, you know, the United States used to be covered with grizzly bears and we hunted them to extinction and like locationally yeah. extinction, yeah. clearly. Um, same thing with wolves. We decided that they were a predator, they needed to go, and we got rid of them. And it happens so fast, and it breaks my heart. Yeah. And I'm gonna not get into it because it yeah. doesn't pertain to the story. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> On November 16th, Alvarenga knew with a storm approaching that he would likely be inland for several days. So he decided to take advantage of the little time that he had before then and get out on the ocean. He and his assistant, Ray Perez, woke up at dawn to get the boat ready. The boat is 25 feet long and about six feet wide. So think like pickup truck. Yeah. Like it's about the size of a pickup truck. The boat had no lights on it and there was no wind or weather block. So there was no like captain's area. There was an engine attached to the back of the boat, which is where they- An outboard motor. Yeah, yeah. maneuvered. Um, but no cover. So but there we're, was, like, we're talking like benches and a, and a motor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the motor was so heavy that if they were going fast enough across the water, the front third of the boat would be sticking up out of the water. Yeah. Alvaranga and Ray planned to leave at about 10 a.m. and return the next day at 4 p.m. And in preparation for this, the men packed a small mirror, toothbrush, toothpaste, a razor, two changes of clothes, in addition to 70 gallons of gas, 16 gallons of water, 100 pounds of fishing bait, 700 hooks, two miles of line, a harpoon, three knives, three extra buckets, a cell phone, a GPS, a two-way radio, and 200 pounds of ice to go in 
the five foot by four foot cooler for the fish. So these guys were bringing a ton of how stuff with they, them. How, I'm surprised that that didn't surpass a weight limit for a boat that size. Well, when That's a lot. completely loaded, <laughs> the boat rode so low that they, they could just like hang their arm off of the side and their hands would be in the water. Oh Lord. <laughs> okay. Al Barango was at this point, he became a captain and he would maneuver the boat while Ray was working as his assistant and would organize and lay out the fishing line into the water. Side by side with several others, they pushed through the surf and the waves where the lagoon met the ocean. And then once through the aggressive waves, everyone cut their engines and looked out into the calm water and had a bit of a powwow and passed a joint from boat to boat okay, before so they went out. A group of them. Yeah. They then went their separate ways. Did they have GPS? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you imagine fishing on the open ocean stoned? I would be so, I'd be like, I'm never going, I'm never getting back. I, I'm gonna be so lost. I, you know, I have, tried smoking and I have tried edibles and I have never gotten high and it's <laughs> so disappointing. I was actually just I'll having fix a, that. I was just having a conversation <laughs> with one of my friends like not that long ago. I was like, look, several years ago I was dating a guy who he grew and, and sold and like was very good with all things weed and he made edible cupcakes for a friend of mine's bachelorette party. We rented a cabin in Michigan. We were staying put and we were like, we're gonna do this. So it was me and two other girls were the only ones willing to eat them. And he had told us, he was like, these are very strong. I recommend starting with half. Okay, it was like half a cupcake. <laughs> yeah. I don't think oh, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, come on. And so like, we all ate half first. And then we were like, eh, like, like an hour later, we're like, nothing's happening. What the heck? Ate another half. Another hour goes by, and like my two friends are like starting to get a little giggly. And I don't remember what we we, we were watching, but we were watching a movie that was not that funny. <laughs> and like out and of you're nowhere, like, hey, wait a second, this yeah. isn't funny. <laughs> like why are you of, laughing? <laughs> out of nowhere, they just start laughing, and then I think it became like one of those things where like the one couldn't stop laughing, so the other one was laughing at her, but then she couldn't stop laughing, and the, so the other one started laughing harder. They were crying and like just could not stop. And I'm just sitting there like. I got nothing. So I went and ate another one. No. Because I was like, I want to feel something, <laughs> damn it. And like, I'm sitting there and like, we're getting towards the end of the movie. And I like felt a little bit of a tingle, like move up from like my toes, like up to my head. And I was like, oh, it's, it's happening. It's happening. It's <laughs> happening. And then it just like poof went away. And I was like, son of a bitch. What? I, and that, that's been like the only thing. Okay. And I'm like, this is dumb. I'm never, I'm never trying weed again. Just give me a glass of wine and I'm yeah. about the same. Right. <laughs> okay. So yeah, they, they went fishing high and enjoyed it. Well, potentially. Potentially. <laughs> there's, there's some question here. By 7 p.m., Alvarenga and Ray had their entire two mile line of hooks towed out behind them. And by 10 p.m., they started to check the lines and while they were not ready to pull in yet, they were able to see that they had some massive fish already hooked. And about 2 a.m., the men started to pull in the line, which took Ray about two hours. And they caught about 1,200 pounds of fish, including mahi-mahi, a massive hammerhead shark, thresher shark, and a sailfin. They then turned back towards land, and Alvarenga and Ray started their five-hour ride back to, I'm going to call it headquarters, to drop off this cooler full of fish. Alvarenga was really happy because his boat was handling the weight and everything really well because his engine had died four days earlier and it required to have him be towed back to oh, land. Yeah. Once they hit land, Alvarenga immediately started prepping to go back out. And that was when Ray, who was a troublemaker, made a really rash decision and 
decided that he was going to go sign his probation papers because he was out on bail for armed robbery. Sign his probation papers at two in the morning? Um, two, it was probably about seven in the morning. So they, okay. they brought in at two in the morning, they started bringing it in. It took them about two oh, hours, hours, which okay. would be about four and then five hours to get back, which would pr probably bring them in about nine. Okay. So he decided to go sign his probation papers <laughs> and he took off and was like, wait for me. I'll be back. Wait for me. And Alvarenga, knowing that there was a storm coming, got really impatient and decided not to wait. So he contacted a friend of his who always had a fisherman's apprentice that he was like working with and convinced him to send an apprentice his way. And this is where Ezekiel Cordoba enters the picture. He was showing a lot of promise as an apprentice, but he was only 22 and had less of two years experience on the ocean and was not very confident in like the ocean water. But Alvarenga was desperate and he just wanted to get back out on the water and get back to land before the storm came in. So he basically was like, get in the boat, we're leaving. Cordoba at only an hour in started getting seasick due to the waves and wanted to turn back at that point. He was like, I'm out, oh, take boy. me back to land. And Alvarenga was like, no, absolutely not. You signed up for a job, we're doing this job and then we'll get back to land. They arrived back to his destination at about 5 p.m. and started rolling out their line, which took about three hours. And at this point, it was about 8 p.m. And so they started like settling, settling down for the night, essentially. At about 1 a.m., Alvarenga felt his boat jolt and noticed that the wave swells had suddenly become strong and high and were beginning to tilt the boat sideways. So even with the two miles of fishing line kind of <clears throat> acting as a stabler, it was still like really, really tipping. This motion also woke up Cordoba and the men immediately started noticing like they needed to bail water because the waves were starting to break inside of the boat. Yeah. And Alvarengo recognized he had better skills at bailing, so he told Cordoba to start hauling in the line, and he bailed. Alvarengo also helped to pull in the catches at the same time, and they were happy to see that they had 10 fish before realizing that this line, which should have been acting as a stabilizer, was actually assisting the storm and tossing them around. So kind of think like a cat toy. If like you've got like the long string and then there's something on the end of that string and you just kind of like whip it and that end just like flies. That's basically how their, their boat was acting. Mm. Also, yeah. as, as a side note, you're, you're potentially just like sleeping in a boat in open ocean, 1 a.m. You, I, can you even, you, I don't know if you can even see what's coming or what's happening. That's no. terrifying. No. Like you can probably tell like waves and you can probably see some like flashes of white with the brakes, but I don't know that you can see like on the horizon, some, a storm a brewing. Yeah. Cause it's, it's one in the morning it's dark out. There's no lights. Yeah. That's terrifying. Yeah. I, I quite honestly am, am scared of like the ocean. Yeah. So the storm was kind of tossing them around and Alvarenga decided to cut the line instead of trying to haul in everything faster. They release themselves from the, from the line and immediately start heading back towards land. And I'm assuming that they had like some sort of compass that he was able to, well, I mean, he didn't have a light, but I'm assuming he had some sort of like compass or some, some way to like directionally know where he had to go. So we, so are we unsure about GPS? He, he has a GPS, but he didn't, it wasn't like he was like using it actively. Okay. So he, he kept the GPS radio, his cell phone and a couple other like electronics inside of a bag at the bottom of a bucket okay. to keep it safe. So at this point it's November 18th and Alvarenga is heading back to land and 
just thinking about the meal that he's going to get when he gets back to land. He's like, this is what this is the food that I want. Cordoba, on the other hand, was not thinking the same things because he was on his knees bailing water as quickly as he could and trying not to get seasick at the same time. Yeah. The wind had picked up to about 50 miles per hour, and luckily Alvarenga was able to maneuver his boat enough that the waves were no longer breaking inside of the boat, which basically kept them afloat. And then he decided to drop the anchor that he had to help stabilize them a little bit. And the anchor that they used was not like the steel anchor that you think of with, like with ships. It was empty bleach bottles that acted more as buoys than an anchor. So Alvarenga was able to see enough that he could appropriately like speed up and slow down as the waves were coming so yeah. that way he could like kind of ride over them rather than them go for a ride and he made it to dawn so daylight starts to come in he's able to actually see what's happening and at this point he estimates that he has about four to six hours before he gets to land so what's normally a five hour journey is taking them like twice as long yeah. because of the storm so at about 7 a.m., there was a foot of water in the boat, and Alvarenga insisted that they take a quick break for breakfast just so that way they could get, like, some sustenance in their body and, and you know, try to get their strength back. Two hours later, they could finally see outline of the mountains, the backdrop of Costa Azul, and he knew that they were roughly 20 miles from shore. And he was thrilled to see this because his engine had begun to cough. Oh. The engine, as they kept going, was getting worse and worse, and it started jolting for power with spurts of misfire, and Alvarenga made the decision to cut the engine. He took it, took it apart, took about 10 minutes to like make sure everything was clean and put together right and fitting it in properly, and put everything back together, stood back, pulled the engine st string, and the engine refused to turn over at all. And so he gets desperate and just starts pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling. And he pulled so much that the cord snapped. Whoa. And this is when he finally pulls out the radio that he has. <laughs> <laughs> so Alvarenga called his boss and asked him to send a rescue. But due to the storm, there was a delay in the men getting out on the water. And by then, Alvarenga and Cordoba had been pulled so far out into the ocean because of the storm that they had no idea where these guys were at. And in addition to this, two other boats from like that same original group were also missing. Oh, okay. That's like the first day is, is basically them traveling losing their engine, and then starting to drift. Oh, On the second day, a wave crashed into them so hard, it washed everything except for the cooler out of the boat. And then five days and approximately 230 miles later, the wind and rain died down and the men finally got a break from bailing water. So imagine that, five days of basically keeping yourself afloat by bailing water. Oh boy. All the while, Cordoba is fighting seasickness. Yes. And they've got nothing. Which no is miserable. They've got nothing at, the, at that point. The, they, they lost everything. Like radio? Radio, all, radio GPS. Um, basically what they have is the cooler, uh, the, the empty bleach bottles that are acting as an anchor, <laughs> and the engine. And the clothes on their back. Oh boy. <laughs> they were already starting to get incredibly thirsty, but they had no fresh water and they could see coconuts floating in the water, but they were scared to go out into the water to get them because they were worried of sh about sharks. And there was like kind of a passing comment in this that they, I mean, you hear about people getting attacked by sharks and you're like, this is not, a, like experts are like, this is not a common thing. Sharks don't like human blood. They don't have a taste for human flesh, which I've actually heard it's because they need like super high fat 
content and people are just not fat enough to meet says those needs. Who? I'm just kidding. <laughs> says who? Um, <laughs> but they they apparently were so they were scared to go in the water because they had heard stories of fishermen going into the water and literally being eaten alive by sharks. Mm. So completely at the mercy of the ocean's current as they drifted farther into the Pacific Ocean. Did they have oars? No. They've got nothing. And just like a really quick note, when it comes to the Pacific Ocean, if you're not aware of how big it is, if you look at a globe and you, you bring your, the center of your focus is the center of the Pacific Ocean, there's no land. Yeah. It's so big. It's the biggest. It's, it is the biggest. Yeah. And <laughs> it's terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> to be like, you're lost where? Somewhere in the blue. Somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere there. So Alvarenga's boat was the worst shape and size to be lost in because it naturally rode low in the water and had nothing sticking up. So even if you were a half mile away from it, you would just see like water. Yeah. It just blends into it, the horizon. There's no... Yes. Jeez. So the first plan of action that these men had was to tie one of their shirts to a wood pole that they ended up finding floating in the ocean. and they were constantly scanning the horizon for boats and the intention was that if they saw a boat that looked like it was going to come close enough they were going to light hmm. the shirt on fire because one of them had a, a lighter in his pocket yeah they had to how are they going to light the joint of course <laughs> um, <laughs> do they still they, have 70 gallons of gasoline nope that got washed out all of it oh boy yep they're like, we're going to light this shirt on fire. Rock, paper, scissors for whose shirt were you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, the first week they saw a container ship, but they knew that it was not coming close enough for them. As the days drug on, Cordoba began to panic and Alvaranga stayed extremely confident and calm. And to provide them with some sort of shelter, Alvaranga tilted the icebox on its side and they crushed themselves together inside of the five foot four by five five foot by four foot ice box. Two grown two grown men yeah. <laughs> crunched themselves inside. And they were like sitting, if I remember right, they they were sitting like knees knees to chest and then their knees were like intertwining with each other to like oh, yeah. fit themselves in. Did they um, dump the fish that was in there? They got rid of the fish? Um, I don't know if they got rid of the fish or if they ended up eating the fish, but they, they had, they had to like, some. very quickly. I mean, they didn't really pull in a whole lot of fish. I think, I think yeah. they pulled in, like, 10 fish huh. before deciding, like, we needed, like, the priority was to get out of the ocean. In, in any case, they are still drifting on the ocean, and now they have no food, and they have no water. The... Um, Ice shelter ended up being a really, really good idea because the, where they were locationally ended up staying around 90 degrees or higher every single day. So that provided them with like just a little bit of shade. And as the worst of the, the thirst really hit, Alvaranga said that he felt like his throat was swollen and when he did swallow, it felt like his spit just kind of like bounced down his throat. Ugh. And he often was trying to cover himself as much as possible because he was pretty fair skinned for being, you know, in Central America, essentially. And he would leave the icebox only at, for 10 minutes at a time to look for boats. And then he would go crush himself back inside of the icebox. Cordoba was a bit worse off as his lips were swollen and cracked and he had red welts all over his body from the ocean water that like sprayed onto him during the storm. It blocked his pores and then like as he was trying to sweat, they like started getting infected. Oh no. So rather quickly, Alvaranga began to notice the large volume of trash floating in the ocean, which is a really unfortunate truth that... There is a lot of trash yeah. floating Giant in the ocean. Patch. And 
whenever they floated close enough to grab items, they would search for anything that could be used and would collect every empty water bottle that they could find with the intention to fill and store water as soon as it rained. They would also find some small crabs and small fish hiding in the trash, but were unsuccessful at catching anything larger. So they were able to get like crumbs, Ugh. I feel like. Ocean crumbs. Joy. Despite this, Alvaranga started eating his fingernails and one morning as they were floating past some jellyfish, he scooped them up and swallowed them whole. And he said that the only they only burned like the top part of his mouth. Whoa. So. That's gangster. Yeah. This guy, if what? there was like some. Ah. What a bold choice. Yeah, if there's like somebody that like you needed to bet on that like this guy's a fighter, this guy's going to survive, it's him. Spoiler. I wonder if it's like him. <laughs> on the menu, jellyfish like spicy, it's like seven out of five. <laughs> Like, yeah, this I don't is gonna know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh man. Ugh. It's like that. What's the guy who has people eat like the 10 wings and each one gets spicier and spicier yeah. and spicier. That would be Hot like ones. challenge. Yeah. This is your challenge. You don't know what it is, but give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the very little bits of food that they were getting obviously does not last long. And Alvaranga started contemplating which of his fingers he would cut off first. And he, he actually decided it was his pinky. I mean, yeah. But then he was like, there's not really a whole lot of meat on my pinky. I can get so much more off of any of my other fingers, but the pinky's the one that I don't need. <laughs> But luckily this didn't last long because swimming just under his boat were some trigger fish, which then led them to discover that there was more fish resting in the shade under their boat. Alvaranga showed impressive skills in his adaptability and figured out a way to fish. He would lean against the side of the boat, arms in the water about a foot apart, and then he would just hold still until a fish swam between his hands and he would then clamp down onto the fish and pull it into the boat, which I have tried doing that. I've tried catching fish with my hands. Yeah. It's not that easy because there's so much resistance in water. Yeah. So then they had a knife and they would clean the fish and cut them up into strips. And if they weren't eating it raw, they would put the strips on the motor to dry in the sun. Okay. So they were drying out the fish. And then even though they were bringing in minimal calories, they still didn't have any water. And Alvaranga began to drink his own urine, which yeah. disclaimer is a terrible thing to do. That's a terrible idea because your body's getting rid of toxins. And, and instead of, you know, keeping those toxins out of your body, you're putting them back in. And then it taxes the liver more because <clears throat> yeah. it then has to not only get rid of those toxins that it already got rid of the, the first time, but it's having to get rid of toxins that your body is creating due to the toxins that you're ingesting. And isn't urine sterile though? I don't think so. I, I like the, the old science said, yeah, drink your urine. And like new studies are showing that it puts really high stress on your liver and kidneys okay. to like recycle that. And you just end up getting to a point where you can't flush those toxins out anymore and you're just poisoning yourself. I wonder, like, what, what's the threshold? Like, because there's the lesser of two evil, evils, like dehydration or I'm going to tax my liver and kidneys. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so sure, when you get to that point. It's like um, maybe once a week? Well, I mean, when you get to that point, you're going to die from one, one, <laughs> one way or another, which yeah. way do you want it to be, you know? So they also found <clears throat> floating in the ocean, a head of cabbage, a carrot, and some rancid milk. Ew. And they consumed all of it. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. After nine days, they still hadn't had any rain or a source of water, so they split the boat in half, and on early mornings, they would lick the dew off of the boat, oh, wow. which I think is smart. Yeah. I don't know how much you're getting. 
but it's it something. Yeah. And then one night, Alvarenga was woken up to a thud on his boat and he felt like the boat jerk a little bit and he was curious. So he left the shelter of the ice chest and found a two foot long turtle. So he grabs a turtle, brings it on board and Cordoba refused to, to try any of the turtle. He said that it was a sin and Alvarenga who admittedly did not find himself attached to religion, used some of the tubing off of the engine and started to drink the blood, which is extremely nutritious. So Alvarenga was just like giving himself some much needed. Yeah. I wonder if I could, if I could keep that down. I mean, after nine days of yeah, no food I and mean, no you're water. Yeah, going to try, but that's so gnarly. Yeah. I have a really, I mean, I have a hard time eating like seafood in the beginning. Just like the texture has to be like just perfect for me to like it. But the idea of eating it raw. I mean, I could, I mean, I, I like sushi. Like I could, I could make it work. I, I guess, I guess I just like plug my nose and drink the blood. You just, I wouldn't yeah. like tasting it would be tough. Yeah. You know how, like, if you get a little bit of blood in your mouth, you're like, ugh. This is gross, yeah. You feel nauseous. It's disgusting. Yeah. Drinking it sounds terrible. It's drinking it does. Dang, two foot long turtle. Yeah. Later, Cordoba does end up giving in to eating the turtle meat, but he refused to drink the blood. And Alvarenga, realizing that they kind of were, like, in a gold mine area of sea turtles huh? started anytime that he saw one nearby he would grab it and put it in the boat and just kind of like stockpile them because he knew that he was like i don't know how long we're going to be here yeah but we got food we got some nutrients and so then after nearly two weeks alvarenga and cordoba woke from the inside of the ice box to the delightful sound of raindrops nice the, the men quickly scrubbed and organized their supplies to help filter rain into the five gallon bucket that they had found and drank like literally from the bucket. Of course, I would too. Yeah. <laughs> um, even after drinking their fill, they decided that they needed to be diligent about only having three cups of water per day. And I think they filled the bucket like like five or six inches up. So they, they got a decent, nice. decent amount of water out of that rainstorm. So Alvarenga then began to use sharks to his advantage when it came to fishing as the schools of fish would kind of like stay under his boat. He noticed that when sharks were coming and hunting them, the fish would almost like slide up the side of his boat to try to escape. And he would use that time to just grab a hold of those fish and, and get them into the boat. And then using the parts from the motor, Alvarenga twice fashioned a makeshift harpoon to use to hunt larger fish. The first one snapped immediately and sank out of sight. And the second landed the men a few large fish before Alvarenga stabbed a fish too hard and it thrashed. He wasn't, he wasn't able to hold, keep a hold on to the harpoon and he also wasn't able to get it out of the fish and it took the harpoon with it. Mm, that sucks. Yeah. After three weeks, Alvarenga began to invent stories and things to do. For example, he would have conversations with the motor before getting angry at it and beating it with anything that he could get his hands on. And he would often tell Cordoba that he was going to the grocery store and walk across the boat to grab some fish fillets or a turtle. Oh boy. He would occasionally go to the market for specific foods. And then when he quote unquote returned, he would tell Cordoba, sorry, they were closed. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And so apparently this is actually a really good thing because it like detaches you from the reality that you're in as long as you don't go like too deep yeah. off the deep end. And so it just kind of keeps you from, from, you know, falling into like the really depressed 
unable to do anything or like too anxious mindset, which is basically just a survival tra tactic yeah. for the brain. Survival like mindset experts have said that this tactic is actually, you know, it gives yourself, it gives you a job, it gives you a purpose, and it gives a little bit of meaning to your life, which is really important when you're in survival situations. And as long as a person is able to pull themselves out of that psychosis and be an active participant in their survival, it's an incredible tool. Yeah. After a month of floating, Alvarenga was so skilled in catching fish, turtles, and birds that they had a like good rotation of options. And he, to catch the birds, he would lay on the floor. So they had like a bench, uh, kind of like going down the center of the boat. And he would lay on the floor of the boat underneath the bench and wait for a bird to land on the bench. And then he would grab a hold of its foot. And initially he was initially breaking their necks right away and just eating the bird. But then as like, they kind of like started getting like some sustenance and, and a stockpile, he would break the wings of the bird so that way they couldn't fly away. And then do what, for what purpose? They would just keep it, they would just put it on the, the floor of the boat. Oh, that's so dark. Okay. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> oh, not great for the birds. Not great for the <laughs> I birds. I thought you were going to say like they used the birds as bait. Um, that would, you know, that would be great if they had like a fishing pole. Well, they had, they had some some line, right? They, from, the, from the engine? They had anything? I think, you know what? That might've been, that might've been something that they could have done, yeah. but they didn't, unfortunately. So <laughs> the just birds- out there torturing seabirds. <laughs> those poor seabirds. They also cut uh, the side out of one of the empty bleach bottles and turned it into a fish trap and and kind of just let it drag behind the boat as they were floating. The men had some food and a small bit of water. They're, they were both suffering from back pain from being scrunched inside of the icebox to escape the sun, as well as suffering from being unable to regulate their body temperatures because of sunburn. Oof. On what they believed was Christmas, so roughly 36 days of floating, the two decided to eat a feast of birds. Cordoba dug into his, but very quickly his stomach began to hurt. He coughed and then began to foam at the mouth. Oh. Throwing away their rule about rationing the water, Alvarenga gave Cordoba half a liter of water, which he quickly drank, but the pain only got worse before he began to vomit. In an attempt to locate the source of the problem, they started going through the meat of the bird that Cordoba had been eating and in its intestines, they found what was left of a yellow-bellied snake, which is a venomous species of sea snake. What are the free chances? What are the chances that he ate a bird that ate a venomous snake? Yeah. Yeah. Ew. Also, so gross. I hate snakes. I, I don't hate snakes. I, snakes have a purpose. Just like every animal yeah, out there, yeah. except for ticks and mosquitoes. Torture all of us. <laughs> I'm kind of surprised he had, I mean, I, I guess I'm not surprised he had a reaction, but it's not, like, it's not entering the blood system the same way. Like, his stomach acids are still processing. So I'm surprised, I don't know, I mean, I'm, I, maybe I'm not totally surprised, but, yeah. I anyway, mean, clearly, yeah, clearly there was enough, like, whatever he ate had enough poison in it that he reacted to it. Oof. With nothing that could be done but ride it out, Cordoba made a full recovery except for the mental strain that this triggered. Cordoba began to refuse bird and questioned Alvarenga as to how the snake ended up in his bird and in no subtlety accused Alvarenga of doing this on purpose. And this kind of, I think he was already spiraling from like the initial hour being on the boat, but I think this is where he really started to like. Yeah, Ezekiel's had a tough ride. Get out of control, yes. 
At this point, the men were stuck in an area of the ocean called the doldrums, which is not only one of the wettest areas on Earth, but they also produce some of the most severe thunderstorms, not just like geographically in that area, but they, they produce some of the strongest hurricanes that hit oh, other countries. Perfect. The storms, as they gather power, stay stationary in this area. And once you're in the doldrums, they're extremely hard to get out of. <laughs> Which is, I mean, it's okay because they have water. They have a source of food. Mm -hmm. But they're not going anywhere. Yeah. While it was storming, they would float through severe downpours and just like sit and collect the water. And so they ended up stockpiling a significant amount of water. They also said that they saw many water spouts and they had, and this unlimited fresh water source made Cordobra like momentarily happy. Around day 104, Cordoba sank into a depression and began refusing to eat. Two weeks later, Cordoba woke one morning to Alvaranga preparing breakfast and yelled that he was dying and that he was thirsty. Alvaranga grabbed a bottle of water and rushed over to Cordoba and tried to pour the water into his mouth. But at this point, Cordoba started to convulse. He groaned and then stilled. His breath became shallow and moments later, it stopped altogether. Oh boy. He survived three and a half months on the ocean with nothing. <laughs> Yikes. It's, yeah, that's, um, that's awful. It is. <clears throat> and it's, it's a terrible, it's an awful way to go. And then it's awful for, um, you know, the guy left alone. Yeah. Oh yeah. So Alvaranga wasn't quite believing what he was seeing and he started yelling at him. Like, you can't leave me alone. You can't oh. leave me out here. And his brain kind of like went back into that salvation mode and he started treating and talking with Cordoba as if he was still alive. Oh, I knew this was going to be like Weekend at Bernie's. I don't know what that is. Or they like, they prop up the dead guy and like pretend oh. like he's, he's alive. And yep. Him. Oh, that's, boy. that's what happens. Oh no. <laughs> so no. a week later. On a moonless night, Alvaranga, and I'm gonna save you the description of what Cordoba's body turns into. Sunburnt mummy is the short Ugh. version of it. So he, he at this point is like, I cannot keep you on the boat with me any longer. So he took all of the clothes off of Cordoba, thinking that he, he could use them and slipped him into the ocean. By this point, the doldrums had released their hold on the boat and Alvaranga was no longer floating passively. He was going faster than he had been and moving away from food and fresh water. Sometime in April, so roughly five months later, Alvaranga leapt into the ocean for the first time, altogether forgetting his fear of sharks, and he was able to pull crustaceans from the bottom of his boat catch fish, turtles, and birds. And now that it was only him, he didn't feel like he needed to ration the food or the water quite as much. One night after a little over six months of floating, Alvarengo woke to the noise of propellers and music. He unfolded himself out of his position in the ice chest and looked out at the water. In surprise, he could see a boat and he could hear people talking. Elated, he started screaming and waving his arms and he grabbed the piece of wood and started banging his engine and making as much noise as he could to grab their attention. But the yacht continued forward and Alvarenga was left alone once again. It's like the ultimate torture. For sure. Oh, oh yeah. About a month after that, Alvarenga woke to a new noise and this noise was of something brushing against the bottom of his boat. Carefully, he again unfolded himself and crawled out to see what was there, and he came face to face with a large eye. An adolescent whale shark oh had found entertainment in his boat and started hanging around Alvarenga for about a week, and he would just kind of like bump the boat 
as they as as he was floating and I don't know what sounds whale sharks make, but apparently he was making enough ruckus at night that Alvarenga was having trouble sleeping. But at the same time, he was also like, when he did sleep, he was sleeping much sounder because he knew that something was there with him. Oh. While thriving in moments of laughter, the physical and psychological effects of surviving in a 25 foot boat were really affecting Alvarenga negatively. He had no social interactions, no support, and no one to help or bear some of the load, and the physical effects were becoming more apparent. Because his only source of calories was protein, and one of the compounds protein is broken down to is ammonia, he had to consume more water than normal in order to flush out that ammonia, and he, because he was rationing the water, he wasn't drinking enough, and he was poisoning himself. A couple symptoms or side effects of ammonia poisoning include confusion, difficulty walking, a lack of coordination, and severe stomach pain, all of which Alvarenga was experiencing. Yeah. Well, luckily he doesn't have to walk, so. That is true. <laughs> he's, he's got There's a limited no amount of space. <laughs> <laughs> he also had a constant headache and an ear infection which he identified after pus began to drip from his left ear. Uh, in a response to the ear infection, Alvarenga used a home remedy method. Disclaimer, nobody do this. <laughs> if you have an ear infection, go to the doctor. <laughs> he used warm urine and to drop into his ear, to like drip into his ear. And it took about three, I think three, like I'm gonna call it doses before it started to help. So he cured himself by putting okay, I mean, urine in his ear. <laughs> if it works, it works. It worked. Uh, alleviate something, right? His stomach was also bloated and hard as a rock. And to ease his stomach pain, which turned out to be a blocked intestine and constipation due to the fish scales and bones that he was consuming, he found that dried shark livers acted as a laxative. And in addition to this, from sitting inside of the cramped ice chest during the day to stay out of the sun, he had slipped three vertebrae and it was causing him to be in significant pain, sometimes so bad that he couldn't walk, which again, he doesn't have very far to go. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, sometime around the end of June, Alvarenga got swept into an eddy, which is like similar to the doldrums and they just kind of like swirl back on itself. So he's moving, unlike in the doldrums where he just kind of like was moving very, very slowly. He's moving in the eddy, but it just continues in the same yeah. circle. And he had an unfortunate luck of being stuck near a dead whale. So he was in this eddy with this dead whale and just kind of like- Just doing a little dance together. Yeah. Um, Corpse and boat. Corpse, boat, tango, Jeez. There was, yeah. Although that would attract fish. It, yes, and also birds. And birds for him to torture. And birds. <laughs> uh, he said that the smell was disorienting, but you know, with it came an abundance of life. And at this point, a large brown bird that was about the size of a goose landed on his boat. And for some reason, Alvarenga saw him as a friend instead of food and named him Pancho. Oh. <laughs> On the one year anniversary back home, Alvarenga and Cordoba were legally declared missing and presumed dead, which allowed their families to collect benefits. And while floating, Alvarenga thought about his daughter Fatima and promised he would show up and be the best father he could be if he was rescued. After 11 months on the ocean, Alvarenga was again spat out of that eddy and started having to ration the food and the water again, which brought back some of the uncomfortable physical effects of, mm -hmm. of you know, surviving in a 25 foot boat. But then something miraculous happened. While Alvarenga was used to seeing container ships in the distance, he spotted one that by his calculations would come directly toward him. Coming up with a plan, one of which was to leap into the water if the ship looked like it was going to run into his boat, Alvarenga eagerly waited and waited. As the ship came closer and closer, Alvarenga was able to see three men standing on the edge, fishing poles in hand. 
Screaming and weaving, Alvarenga was overjoyed. The men, hearing his screams and seeing him wave, waved back and kept on going. No. Oh my gosh. Yep. Kayla. Yep. I think, I think that might break me. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think I might like give up after that. Yeah. Alvarenga does too, because at this point he starts to dramatically deteriorate yeah. and is pretty much doing the absolute minimum. He's not stockpiling food anymore. Yeah. He's not trying to collect water. He's not looking for boats as much anymore. Oh, boy. On January 29th, 2014, 438 days or 14 and a half months after his engine failed, Alvarenga spotted land and he was heading directly towards it. Oh my gosh. That's, to occupy, <laughs> Sorry, that, that's, that's how he doesn't even get found? He just makes his way back to land? <laughs> that's so wild. <laughs> I, does that ever happen? Yes, <laughs> to him. Oh my gosh. It gets better, okay. it gets better. Okay. So to occupy his mind, he basically just started slaughtering the animals and eating them. Oh my God. And I'm sorry to tell you that. Okay. As an animal lover. Yeah. Uh, okay. There was other things that you could do to, to occupy your mind, but he like couldn't think of anything else yeah. to do. To be fair, he's, he's, um, he's, his brain is broken. His brain is broken yeah. for sure. And then once he was close enough to land, he leapt from his boat, finding rocky ground under the waves, but he was unable to walk because his legs were too weak. He pulled himself through jellyfish infested shallows and moved up on the high ground where he then passed out and slept for the first time again on land. Oh. This guy, bet on him. Dude. <laughs> When he woke up, he was covered in leeches and slugs, but also found some coconuts that he smashed open and drank water from. And from his vantage point, he could see a small cluster of islands separated by a channel of water. And there near the channel was a men's red shirt hanging out to dry. Overjoyed, he immediately started to work in the direction of human life when suddenly the thought that they could be cannibals came to him. And so he kind of like sat back for a little bit of time, like not sure that he actually wanted to go find out. And he finally like pushed that fear down and crawled his way forward. Is that prevalent in that area or is he just paranoid? I think he was just paranoid. Oh, okay. Yeah. I think, I think, well, I have a theory, okay. but we're going to come to that in about two paragraphs. Okay. <laughs> um, once he neared the channel, Emmy and Russell, and I'm going to butcher this last name, Liakadrick, noticed Alvarenga and Emmy immediately knew that he needed help. They rushed to him, brought him into their home, gave him food and clothes and a place near the fire and then contacted authorities. He ended up on a very, very, very small, secluded cluster of islands, like on the other side of the Pacific. What? Yeah. I don't remember what they're called. I unfortunately did not put it down here. Like, the, like Asian islands? He yes. crossed the Pacific? He crossed the Pacific. He was... I'm kind of surprised it didn't take longer. I want to say that he was like 2,000 miles or something away oh he they in the book 438 days they have a map of what they they think he traveled based yeah. on like the information that he was providing and they basically have like there's like the two sections one where he's in the doldrums where it's just like a whole bunch of squiggly lines back and forth because he barely moved for months and then there's like the eddy where he like just circled around a whole bunch of times and they, they, I think they said that he averaged, when he was out of those two locations, he averaged like seven to nine miles per hour, 24 seven. Oh, wow. So, I mean, he, he was moving. It was just, you know, on the ocean. I wonder if, if, cause okay, clearly they didn't speak the same language. No. So I wonder if like he's, what is his experience having been 
lost at sea for more than 400 days, things are not working well no. in his brain. No. He, and his, he's physically deteriorated quite a bit. And then he ends up with a stranger that doesn't speak. Like, did he think? <laughs> like, what was he, he thought thinking? they were cannibals. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess, like, yeah. That yeah. would be such a, such a, uh, a crazy, crazy experience. Yeah. Like, and just that part. And he, he talks... I mean, I'm, I'm g glossing over this end, end part in yeah. comparison to what he, the details he provides in the book. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, the, the police come and get him and he's like terrified. And he felt like he couldn't leave. He felt like he was trapped. He felt like, you know, he was being arrested and he didn't know what was what for and he didn't know what he did wrong. And like the whole time they're just trying to give him care. So through several people and many channels, they finally connect that Alvarengo was the missing fisherman from Mexico from 14 months prior. Oh. I think there was a doctor. At some point, they end up meeting a doctor who speaks Mexican Spanish, and they realize that like these two can communicate. And so that guy becomes the, That's his lifeline. Uh, yeah, a little yeah. bit of a safe harbor for him. Yeah, like I said, it, it, I'm really glossing over the end yeah. of it. So it took Alvarenga six weeks to be strong enough to be able to handle the return to Mexico. And once he was there, he connected with his daughter and Cordoba's mother to answer all of her questions and to speak to her about her son. So in 2015, Alvarenga's book, 438 Days, where, like I said, this is, I pulled all of the information from this book, was released, and this is, this is where I have my theory about the cannibals. Hmm. Cordoba's family happened to sue Alvarenga almost immediately after he released this book for cannibalism in the amount of $1 million. And I'm, it, if you look this up, people, like a lot of the news sources are saying like, oh, in response to him releasing the book, Cordoba's family sues him. And I don't, I don't know how Mexican courts work, but it is so slow to build a case, to get everything typed up, to submit it to the courts, to have that be like, like you have to go through a notice period and and, and like, there's like so much information there that it just doesn't, like, I just think like those two events just happened to coincide. Clearly they can't prove anything. They don't have Cordoba's body. Yeah. They only have Alvarenga's story. Whether that happened or not is not up for me to decide, but I do think it's curious that the first time Alvarenga is interacting with people, his first thought is they could be cannibals they could try to eat me. Yeah, it's a very curious first re first re reaction or first thought. Yeah. Um, and again, yeah. which from, from like the beginning of the book and like how it like outlines his already like previous behavior, I feel like that tracks. Like he, he spent time cleaning up the town and, and building a good reputation mm -hmm. and a, a good work ethic and you know, he, he was the, Alvarenga was the one catching all of the food. He didn't need to get food from Cordoba. Yeah, I mean, and honestly, like, if Cordoba had died and Alvarenga then cannibalized his body, okay. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. That makes sense. There was, a, I think, a soccer team whose plane crashed in the Andes, and they did that. Yeah. And it's all bets are off when it's survival time. Look, look, they were already dead. Yeah. Now, if he obviously like the nefarious part would be if he had intentionally killed him to eat him. But mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I, it's obviously it's possible. Yeah. It's based on like other stories I've heard, like it, that's just not your, the value is in having someone there. Yes. Especially if, like, you can get other food. Yeah. 
Like they were able to get some fish. It's not like ideal, but they were able to eat. Yeah, obviously he survived 438 days. But I, I think when you're in that situation, um, armchair quarterbacking. But I, I think you're, you value company more than more than that. The, the unless he had food. absolutely nothing. But even then, I don't know. Yeah. But if he died and he cannibalized his body, like yeah, fine, duh do it yeah if i die this is not permission for anybody to kill me but if i die and you're in a survival situation with me fine yeah i i i don't really want my body buried in a casket anyways that yeah. i'm claustrophobic don't put me in that yeah like it's like you're helping to further life yeah that's like the best thing your dead body could do mm -hmm. um yeah i mean i get the family being upset um yeah, who, who knows their real intentions. Yeah. But they couldn't have won. I don't know. We so, don't know? I don't know. So the, the Mexican court system is different than the American court system, and I wasn't really able to find anything. And I could only find articles that were like, he was sued. Nothing about family was given this much. Like, there was no information about that. So either, like, I mean, either way, it... it they didn't get their million dollars because if they did that, that would have been reported. Yeah. Dude, how, how thankful are you if you're Ray? <laughs> I dodged a bullet. For sure. <laughs> Thank God for probation papers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so before we wrap up here, I want to, I want to leave you with a quote from Steve Callahan, who also survived floating in the Atlantic ocean but he, he was only there for 67 days in Ugh, comparison to smuck. the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you can do better than that. Um, <laughs> Little so leagues. He says, people think you just sit around and wait to wash up on something. And I always have to point out to people that survival is not a passive activity. It's an active pursuit. If you don't work at it, you're screwed. And I think that's, that gives a different appreciation for Alvarenga working and surviving yeah for 438 days yeah that's uh, a monumental effort huge yeah and again probably like more than anything the mental aspect yeah because like for sure physically of course it's difficult given well, the right mindset and like trying to maintain any amount of one sanity two hope and like, and then three, just like functional, like to actually do things. Yes. I, I can't, I can't even imagine. And he did it for, all right, 438, 104, 334 days by himself. That's a lot. Yeah. It's almost an entire year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, it probably like permanently changed him, like his, his, Obviously, that's a stupid statement, but I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. um, like his, like his, his mind, mm -hmm. like, you know, that people talk about, um, solitary confinement and like, after yeah. a certain amount of time, they don't come back out the same. No. Like humans are not designed for that. And there's, I watched many years ago, I watched a show about, it was actually about death row inmates and multiple of them were in jail. They were serving solitary confinement and they basically did anything. That they, they, they were going crazy enough that they were doing anything they could to break more laws so that way they could get put on death row. So that way it could just be done. And they, they didn't want to be in solitary confinement anymore. So they were doing anything to expedite the process. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks it's... for for coming back on and yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm the very first part. The first part of my intro was pulled directly from the book that I read for the story. It's another book that I've read multiple times. It's called 438 Days, and it spoiler is spoiler alert. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. Maybe maybe we'll insert this at the end so that way it's not a spoiler. 438. 438 days. Um, it's 